Well, okay, here we go. Once upon a time. Cruise Stories with Jonathan Wolf. Protecting the highest office in the land demands the toughest man in the business. Thanks for coming back for inauguration day. But you're not getting the president to protect. Oh? You get one mama. The first lady? I've been reading and hearing about her. She's a very difficult woman and a bad influence on the president. Somebody just tried to kill you. Million dollars is a lot of money for near misses. You've been reporting our whereabouts to the president? Charles Bronson. Has it ever occurred to you that the president might be the one who wants you dead? Jill Ireland. Cow would never hurt me. Bronson. Assassination. For Canon, I got called up. Hananya called me. Well, he had production call me. Hananya as in Hananya Bayer. And I, I'd just come back from, I don't know where I'd been. I was really tired and it was not long after my first wife had passed away and my personal life was kind of in a shambles. Mm. So production calls me at like nine o'clock in the morning. Hananya asked us to call you. He wants you to come in and finish a movie that he's working on. So we're at blah, blah, blah location. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, you woke me up. Secondly, before you start giving me details, I want to know what the show is and, you know, what the rate is and little things like that. So it was a series of phone calls back and they told me the rate and I hung up on them. <laughs> they called me back after a few minutes and it was like, Oh, Hananya says, you know, and the producer says, they'll pay you more, da, 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 da. So after the, like, the fourth phone call, I was like, all right, all right, what is this? Well, we're shooting in town, then we're going up to Lake Tahoe to shoot. And it was one of the Bronson movies. Assassination? Um, I, if, if you say so. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. Bronson movie. So, and then they gave me the, the time frame, and I said, oh, that's not going to work. And she said, why not? And I said, well, my son, I, I was a single dad at that point. I had a 10 year old son. And I said, I promised to take him to Disneyland on his birthday. And no, I'm not going to be in Lake Tahoe. And so, oh, confusion, confusion, cover the phone, came back. She said, we'll give you that day off. And I said, well, not only are you going to give me the day off, but you're going to get me back to Disneyland for that day. I don't care where we are. I'm not working that day. So. They okayed it, damn it. Wow. So I went in and I walked in. It was an absolute shit fight. The fella they'd fired as the key grip and half of his crew were horrible, miserable, and they'd upset everybody. And first thing I see walking on the set is the grip truck is like parked a mile from the set. I saw the transportation coordinator and I said, yeah, I knew the guy. I said, why is my truck so far away? He said, talk to the pricks who were on the show before. He says, that's where we put it. They had to walk too far, then fuck them. So it's like, okay, I get it. Okay, so it's a shit show. So anyway, so I went. What's canon? Of course, it's a shit show. I mean. Well, it was. It wasn't that bad, but it, these guys had really done all the wrong things and alienated every other department. And, you know, the guys who were left were horrible. And oh, but anyway, so we go up to Tahoe. So it comes time to go back to L.A. So I guess the day before, the afternoon before. I'm in a minivan, Bronson was going back as well. So there's me, there's Bronson, and there's Jill Ireland, who was his wife at that point. And we started talking, and I was very interested in, in speaking with her because she was a, a cancer victim who'd written a book about it, and she had exactly the same kind of cancer as my wife had died from. So we struck up a good conversation about it. Then we get to the Reno airport to fly back to LA. So she and I are sitting at the bar, and she was telling filthy stories. I mean, really, really dirty jokes and very funny. And Bronson sitting like 20 feet away at a table by himself with that Bronson scowl, which is like permanent, <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting there with his lovely wife and we're having the best time drinking away and telling filthy jokes and screaming with laughter and stuff. So that, that was quite a moment. So went to one, one of the few people in the world who's been to, flown to Disneyland and and back on the company dime. I got paid for the day. They paid the transportation round trip and everything, which wow. I thought was kind of nice. Yeah. I mean, for Canon, that's really saying something. Uh, like, indeed. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, I yeah, mean, that's but, amazing. Uh, they really wanted you. 
I mean, that's I, somehow I doubt that Menachem ever heard about it. But um, <laughs> yeah. it was kind of eerie because sometime later, Jill had passed away, and I was asked to key a TV movie, The Jill Island Story. It was it was kind of weird, but it was okay. Right, yeah. That was Lance uh, Hendrickson played Charles right. Bronson. Was he Bronson? Jill, Jill Clayber yeah, he played Clayber. Uh, Jill Ireland. Jill, Jill, do not look me in the eye, Clayber. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, stay the hell out of my eyeline, Clayber. Uh, that's, yeah. that's what I got yelled at my first day of the PA, too. I was like, don't Good. stand in her well, eye. you learned something. <laughs> but you're still here, too. You know, I, I, I had a conversation with the person who'd broken her eyeline, and I had a conversation with her as well, a very discreet conversation about that person who was looking at I like was lighting you and you know it's probably important to you personally that you look good and it's necessary sometimes for the technical people out there to you know check how the lighting looks on you and she was a lot better after that wow. but yeah <laughs> but um anyway it was kind of weird and and then i came into day play i think with one of my cranes on another bronson movie ages later oh and really it was, uh, yeah it was i don't remember what the show was some house somewhere i mean I, I i did this a lot with my cranes 20 years in hollywood i never slept i was always working <laughs> but uh, or at disney <laughs> but um yeah so we broke for lunch and I'm sitting there with the guys, I knew some of them, and suddenly it was the empty seat next to me, Bronson sitting there. And this, suddenly the table goes totally quiet, you know, it's like, it wasn't the only empty seat. And so he starts talking to me, and like having this conversation, he remembered me from sitting in the airport in Reno, I guess. It was kind of <laughs> odd. Gee, he knows, he knows. <laughs> the is he is aloof as you know you always hear that he's kind of aloof or intimidating he was that way he yeah. i mean if you if you know the history of the guy he grew up with one of a family of eight or something dirt poor they were coal miners really hard i think lithuanian or something but it, it, just an incredibly tough 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 younger life mm -hmm. so yeah that that was he was not a light-hearted person <laughs> that's funny that yes. was uh i think assassination was the last movie he did with Jill Ireland too, right? They did like 15 movies yeah. together or something. Yeah, it could they did be. a lot, a yeah. lot of films together. I have a book here somewhere. Yeah. It's a very good inspirational cool. book. But uh, yeah, we, we sort of hit it off. I mean, you get that. I mean, I did a, there was another movie about the same time you may have come across called Sixth and Main. Leslie Nielsen playing the straight role, which is how he started out. Mm -hmm. What a lovely person he was. And also Arthur Penn. The was, director, Arthur Penn? Uh, no, he he played a role in, oh. in it. Oh. And Beverly Garland, who owned the Beverly Garland's Hotel in oh. Studio City and was a known actress also. Oh, Rowdy McDowell was mm. in it too. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it because, was, it yeah, was, you got to work with uh, Leslie twice in Foxfire Light in 83 too, right? This is scary. <laughs> you guys got like a hidden camera in... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And that was a delightful experience. The first, I, I did one of those awful things during Six in Maine. We were shooting in, in Venice, California, which in those days, a lot of the canals were still open, you know, not much more than sewers, basically. And did a big night shot, which was a fight sequence for Leslie and Arthur Penn, sort of knee deep or waist deep in water in one of the canals. And there was a whole bunch of... of concrete rubble next to the canal including what had been a, probably a foundation of a building and it was just basically a, a hole it was like 10 by 10 with rough concrete edges and we couldn't protect it easily and cover it so they'd been doing their fight thing in the water we had a big bank of 10ks in their eyes after the fight when they came up out of the water and there was a great fear that they would be blinded by the lights and they would fall into this hole and die a horrible death <laughs> after the fight so my task was to rush down to the water. I think I was carrying a furniture pad as well to wrap around one of them because they'd be wet and cold. And this was like a night shoot, was to rush down and warn them, stand in front of it, don't fall in the hole, don't fall in the hole, don't fall in the hole, when they were just fresh from doing the scene. So I was ready and they did their scene and it was cut. So I did my thing. I rushed down to warn them, don't fall in the hole. And guess who fell in the hole? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. And, you know, it's the usual thing if, if it's ever, if you've been unfortunate enough for something like that to happen to you. The first thing is the fear of embarrassment. You're this huge thing of, while you're still falling, you're going through the air. It takes 10 minutes for you to fall through the air, right? And you think, oh, fuck, everybody's going to think I'm so stupid. <laughs> and then, bang, you hit, you know. 
So yeah. that that was kind of what happened. And then the next thing is there's Leslie leaning down over the edge of the hole saying, are you all right? Thank you. My lovely wife just brought me a cup of delicious tea. Oh, uh, hello. I hope it's delicious. Well, uh, I'm sure you. it is. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so it's Leslie Nielsen is, you know, concerned and is leaning over and, you know, are you okay? And I was like, of course I was going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, there was water in this foundation hole and uh, I looked down at it and I thought oh there must be some old paint cans or something in here because the water's all turning red and it was like oh, no 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 that's my blood that's oh. coming out of my leg which is ripped wide open oh, my so God. um Leslie actually helped pull me out and and I stood there and there's this little circle of people standing around as, as you know things like this happen they're just one guy saying well should we take him to hospital you know this uh, i'm like nobody's doing anything so i took off my shirt and put a tourniquet on my leg <laughs> oh, <laughs> myself my God. And one of uh, somebody else fainted dead away at the sight of all the blood and Oof. so anyway eventually they took a vote i guess and found a vehicle and took me off to the hospital <sighs> and they sewed me up and the guy said you better get home quick because this is going to really start hurting like a mother when the pills wear off okay so i went back to the set the sun was just coming up i was the grip best boy on this picture and the sun was just coming up and i went back to get my car and drive home while i still could drive and everyone's going you know are you okay are you gonna be all right you know and i say I'm going home, you know. And then the key grip came up, sweetest guy in the world. And he says, where the fuck have you been? And he was the only guy on the set who didn't know what had happened. <laughs> and he says, I've had to wrap this whole fucking truck on my own. God damn it. I almost died. No, 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 no. Wounded. <laughs> You know, so and uh, he's, he's, it's to this day, Kurt Young is his name. He's still, every time I hear from Kurt, he's still apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, funny. so I was off for like a week and I came back on the show. First thing on the set, Leslie comes over to me. Are you okay? How's your leg? You know, you remembered. So years later, I did Fox Fire Light and Horrible Brands of Missouri. And Leslie shows up and he looks at me and says, how's your leg? It was oh, wow. amazing. He's a human being. Or he yeah. was a human being. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Lovely man. Yeah, he seemed like door. a great guy. I mean, he seemed yes. like he would be great, you know. Some of them are. Some of them are. Most of them are. I was just saying to Leslie Nielsen that I've been a fan of his for so many years, going back to, gee, I guess, 49, 50. 1949, that's right. Yes, 19. and you reacted like you were sort of surprised to hear somebody say that they well, followed your career all that time. It, yes, it, because, it, it, you know, as an actor, you um, you start working, you have your dreams in the very beginning, I mean, or you hope that somebody's going to come along and see you do a marvelous show, or no matter what it is, and say, my, there's somebody, that's where we have to get him, you'll skyrocket to whatever it is. And then eventually you reach a point where you say, well, that's not going to happen, so you devote all your time to your work and you get involved in your work. And what you do is you endure. You're just there. You're doing your job and people are saying fine, your friends are telling you good work, but nobody is talking that much. And you're just around long enough and the work piles up and piles up and finally, as I say, I sit down and somebody like you says, hey, I've seen your work. And you feel that you've gotten up to the straw on the camel and finally, all of that effort uh, is sort of beginning to bear fruition. And it's really delightful. It's so pleasant to hear it. I did a TV movie with Linda Carter called mm -hmm. um, Still um, Watch. Was that the Still, Still Watch? Watch? Yeah. How do you do that? I, well, I did research on it. I haven't seen it, but I, I read about on, it. I read are you on Jeopardy it. at any point? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, but yeah, so anyway, um, we, we a small unit when we shot in LA, we went off to Washington DC to shoot and there was just a very small group of us so we we're in the VIP lounge at LAX with Linda Carter her husband who's like this big noise Washington lawyer and the director Rod Holcomb who was a personal friend of mine and Angie Dickinson just a few other people and so you know we, we all started talking as humans you know 
and that continued with me and Angie all through the flight and then riding the shuttle bus into our hotel in Georgetown all the way through. And she was such a delight. She was a lovely lady. And it's refreshing that, you know, big name people like that can still be humans as well. And, you know, I used to sort of be basically her companion slash bodyguard. She wanted to go out shopping in Georgetown and stuff and she can't walk around on her own, obviously. So I'd be the, the guy with her. Oh, and cool. uh, another movie... Um, she seems really cool. You know that movie that I'm thinking of right now, right? Oh, uh, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is it Grand guys. Slam? Oh, okay. bad, bad guys. Bad, bad guys. guys. You were that, uh, bad guys has uh, James Booth in it too, right? It did. Yeah. 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 You're eerie. I tell you. <laughs> it is downright eerie. But it also had Ruth Buzzy. Yes. As a, a wild and crazy uh, lady wrestler. And, and, a bunch of wrestlers are in it too because at the yeah, time yeah, it was wrestlers. a big wrestling movie at the time it was it yeah. was it was yeah. an, another Hananya bear movie and uh yeah i i had a lot of fun in that i really you know i hung out with the wrestlers and was sort of thrown around as a as a, a little like a chew toy if, if you will <laughs> <laughs> in the ring but uh you know Hananya is a pretty little guy and i i would run interference on him hand holding in the ring and stuff <laughs> I, cool. I got bloodied and bruised, but I ate it up. But but Ruth Buzzy again, would you know we buddied up, we 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 were jogging companions in the morning and stuff like that. Oh, that's which is kind of cool. She's just a lovely lady, just a lovely person. Alex Gardner has a unique talent, and even he doesn't know what it can do. No one has ever done it before. No one has even conceived of doing it before. You're going into another person's dream. If I have to see that, you believe it. He is about to enter a world that no one has ever seen before. The world of your dreams. I got called by an English DP who is doing Dreamscape, and I'd done some commercials with him prior to that, and we hit it off okay, I suppose, and things went well. So he wanted me to come in and work on this thing called Dreamscape, which sounded interesting. Dennis Quaid and some other names. Chuck Russell was the production manager, and I'd worked with a colleague slash friend, Ben Haller, numerous times, but particularly with previously doing commercials with this guy, English DP. So I thought it would be great to bring Ben on board as my best boy. And I talked to the DP about that, and he said, well, I don't care what your job descriptions are on the call sheet, but yeah, Ben would be great. Why don't both of you call yourselves Key Grip? I don't care. So fine. Ben, who's got a marvelous IMDb history and was previously at one point road manager for the Grateful Dead and has got amazing photographs and stuff. Anyway, he's a good guy. Eating Raul. Now that may... That's a crazy movie. Familiar. Yeah, that's, <laughs> okay. that's a funny so movie. So ben, ben not only worked on it, but he played a, an on-screen role. He was a nurse for some reason that seems to have disappeared into history. You know, he's, he's a very big person with a lot of hair and a great big head and stuff. And he was squeezed into a, a, a female nurse uniform for his <laughs> appearance. There was no apparent reason in, in the script, but anyway, so if you ever see Eating Raul again, watch out for Ben. It's been a while. Uh, he, he did rock and roll high. Anyway, so Ben came on board with me and we decided at that point to do something uh, wild and crazy in that this was, as far as we knew, mainly a location picture. And we removed all the shelving from my five-ton grip truck and built carts so that every piece of equipment in the truck could be rolled out on wheels, which now is very standard practice. But back then it was kind of innovative. And so we spent numerous days at Ben's strange shop in Van Nuys, California, measuring, welding, and prepping the truck for that. And it worked out real well. And it has become a standard thing. In the middle of all that work, I remember Ben had an extension bell on his landline. We didn't have things called cell phones then. The phone rang and he dropped what he was doing in the truck and went inside and he was gone for like 20 minutes. I thought, where the hell is he? And he came back out shaking his large head and I said, what was that about? You know, come on, man, I'm working here. And he said, oh, there's some weird production. They're shooting in, I think it was South Carolina in a closed down, disused uh, atomic power plant. 
and they want me to rig this gigantic silt of uh, this pond or pool in it. And I said, oh, okay. And we sort of went back to work. And that, of course, was the abyss. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, they were shooting underwater and they used the, the closed down nuclear thing for their location. And they wanted it so that when they broke through to the surface, if it was bright sun, they could control that or have a, a big scrim that they could drag over the top of the pond, which was like, you know, the size of a football field, I guess. Wow. So anyway, that was sort of Ben's sort of area. He was a rigging master and that was his sort of forte. Anyway, so we started on the picture and it was hard work, but we enjoyed it. In the last week or so of shooting on location involving camera car, involving a huge as the British call it, a windy light, which was a, a vast light, which was, you know, pre-LEDs, pre-HMIs, I think, mounted on a, a big construction crank. There was just, everything was going on that night. So we had like a, I don't know, a 5 p.m. call or something like that. We showed up with a fairly decent sized group department and uh, everybody sort of met up around the craft service for coffee before we started. And Ben nonchalantly says, oh, by the way, this is gonna be my last day on the show. And it was like, what? And he said, yeah, actually I gotta leave at midnight because I've got an early call tomorrow morning. I'm starting another show. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for all the notice. So it was a madness. It was, it was just insane. But there was a lot of big night exterior shots, running shots. I distinctly remember falling asleep on the, cam on the back of the camera car while doing a run waking up with my head in the script supervisor's lap, which was a bit embarrassing, but oh. Uh, yeah, so we got it all done and then some political stuff happened and I was not invited to do the on stage portion of the movie. So that was a bit difficult. There was a, a personality issue with a, another department head who'd been very much suppressed by the fact that the heads, there were two heads of the group of department, both of whom were somewhat ebullient, should we say. And so he was kind of pressed down. So he saw an opportunity with Ben not there to become the uh, big man on campus and he did so. So anyway, you know, I cried into my pillow for all of 30 seconds, but uh, you know, life yeah, went move on. on. <laughs> I, I did not starve as a result. I remember helicopters landing outside a mansion in Bel Air and Dennis Quaid being a, a nice fellow to work with. And yeah, I think it, it actually went quite smoothly. The show went quite smoothly, apart from my little hiccup. But okay, which leads me to another story and which may be the last one. I got called, oh, 19, I don't know, sometime and it was a fairly last minute thing to go to Brazil and shoot a movie with Sandy Howard producing again and uh, called Savage Harvest. But oh yeah, with well, Tom, Sca Tom Skerritt. Tom yeah. Skerritt. Yeah. And, okay, so they gave me production in LA gave me a list of, of things I had to do. I had to get a work visa for Brazil. I had to get a medical certificate. I had to get a chest x-ray and a shot and stuff. And they, they worked out a little a list of places I had to go one day and get all these things done. So I'm ticking things off the list, traveling around and I've got a doctor's office to visit Hollywood. It's just on Hollywood Boulevard and I go there, there's the address and steps leading up into an upstairs medical thing. So I walk up there, open the door and it's a standard doctor's waiting room and there's only one person in it. It's Michelle Phillips. And you know, my teenage heartthrob, <laughs> yeah. love goddess, you know, <laughs> sitting there. And I'm looking at her and she looks at me and goes, Oh, you must be John Wolf. <laughs> You're like he she knows my name. <laughs> your, your life oh flashes my goodness. before your eyes. It, oh it my goodness. Me, and at the ninth nanosecond, it occurred to me that she was also in the movie and she had the same list of things that she had to do. <laughs> And so she was waiting to see this guy as well. And production had said, oh, this is going to be this other guy from the movie there, John Wolf. So, yeah, it was kind of a moment. Of, wow. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I've oh been waiting God. for you, John Wolf. She was, she was. And so we, we actually, we got, in she Brazil, we got, we got to be, uh, you know, sort of uniting mm. against the enemy there and everything was the enemy. We got to be good buddies. And we did this one scene, Savage Harvest is probably a picture. Oh, Maybe you have seen it. I don't know. I have but seen the, it. Uh, the Lion movie? The, the, yeah, lion? the Lion movie. I wanted the, to ask you yeah. about what it was like. 
lions. Yeah, I wanted to ask yeah, you about say, that. Be, yeah, because retrospectively, when you hear about these movies, any movie about working with lions or tigers or whatever, like it, there's never a story where, oh, it went fine. We had this, this defines what a dolly grip does. It really does. Lions don't hit their marks very well. So it's important to remember that. There is one scene in Savage Harvest where Michelle is one of her friends, who's a housekeeper, who had been chewed up by a lion. So she's walking around in her house and they're trapped in the house because the lions are all encircling the house and trying to bust in and eat the people. I mean, that, that was the reality. That wasn't the script, but no. Um, <laughs> but it was pretty close to reality as well. But so she's walking around and picking out tchotchkes around the room and sort of having that. And then she opens this closet door and there's a mirror on the back of the door. And she looks in the mirror and sees a lion behind her in the room that's broken into the house. Oh, so the camera on the dolly is moving around, shooting her somewhat randomly walking around the room. Okay, so we're doing a dance together. She is moving around and I'm watching where she is going. No monitor, this is like film, okay? There's no video village, there's no monitor on the back of the dolly. It's back with film with no video tap where the dolly grip has to know what the lens is on the camera and roughly what it's seeing and just adjusts. So it's now lining up, if you will, Michelle in the mirror and the lion and the extent that the door is opened, the angle of the mirror, getting it totally lined up. Challenging, but it's absolutely dancing a dance. It's getting all those elements right. Cause you can't say to the lion, oh, sorry, you know, we're going for take two. And would you mind please being over another six inches next take? You know, the lions don't do that. So th there was a lot of that sort of thing in that movie. It was really, really bringing out my craft, what I, I love to do and what great company to do it. At. Ronnie Taylor shot that movie. Little picture he did called Gandhi. Um, little picture. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, many, uh, he was the camera operator on Barry Lyndon. Panavision made lenses for that movie that were extremely low level light. There were scenes lit by candlelight. So, I didn't know which that. means you've got, you've got a depth of field of this. So when you're shooting that stuff, wow. you really have to be good. You really, really have to be good to keep it in focus. Ronnie was amazing. So to be shooting in that sort of company was really challenging, but really gratifying at the same time. Sidebar to Savage Harvest, there was a movie called Roar, mm -hmm. which you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be one and the same movie. Tippi Hedren, with her great passion for lions and a husband, Noel Marshall, had their lion sanctuary and their trainer was Ralph Helfer, a next door neighbor. So they wrote a screenplay together uh, with the bare bones of it, which was about lions monstering people in a house. They were going to make this movie together and then it got into fuck you, no fuck you, no fuck you, no fuck you. And they went away and they both made the same movie. One of them was Roar and one of them was Savage Harvest. Wow. So clever old Sandy Howard was a guy who produced movies definitely B movies by discovering different places on the planet where there were tax advantages to make movies. And without a dime to his name, he would go as he did to Brazil with a, a fascist government. Uh, you could not take your, it doesn't matter how rich you were in Brazil, you could not take your money out of the country. You couldn't could take it offshore, but you could take a film offshore. So he got his investment money for Savage Harvest, which was set in Africa, of course. Mm -hmm. He raised it from wealthy business people in Brazil very easily because they pour the money into the production. And God knows what his, his producer fee was. Mm -hmm. But then the movie could just got out of the country. So all the millions and millions and millions of dollars that movie was bound to make, if you ask Sandy, was now in U.S. banks. Did that. He did that all over the world. He did that in Greece with a hang gliding movie. And he used members of the Greek army for hang gliding soldiers and stuff and for mm -hmm. no charge because he bullshitted into getting free extras for it. And one of them, sadly, was killed bad landing or something. And under wow. Greek law, that made Sandy personally guilty of manslaughter. And he had to bribe his way out of jail and be smuggled out of the country. Wow. Uh, but anyway, so while we were doing that, Jan de Bont, was the DP on Roar, believe it or not, back before he was young, but, and uh, he was still a big asshole then. 
<laughs> he got he got hospitalized. He he got his his skull ripped open by a lion. Oh, he was hospitalized for a while. Holy there were rumors that were there were people actually killed on that movie that were quietly buried on on site on the farm. Wow. But that's just rumors. But we didn't kill anybody. But there were some people severely injured. Savage Harvest. People want it to be released on DVD or Blu-ray because it's only been released on VHS. But I guess they can't remaster and, and release it because there's a Beatles song in the movie. And there's I guess a what? there's a one Beatles song in Savage Harvest that's playing in the background at some You're point. Right. And that's why they can't release it on Blu-ray. It's tied wow. up. Yeah, because I, I did some research into it. There's a lot of people that want it released and a lot of yeah. fans. But yeah. uh, they said that they have to pay way too much Shout Factory wanted to release it, so they were trying to get the rights. But because of the Beatles licensing, they were like, we can't afford it. Wow, that's so, an interesting story. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, you know, in between takes, standing around and the, the, we shot most of it. The house of, had been a derelict coffee plantation. Big, 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 big house in the middle of nowhere. And in between, standing around singing Mamas and the Papas songs with Michelle Phillips That's awesome. there. It was, yeah, totally amazing. <laughs> the first AD on it is another name you may know, Brian Frankish. He produced a little thing called Field of Dreams. Oh, yeah, I love Field of mm. Dreams, yeah. Yeah, me too. Well, that's and, a great movie. Well, yeah, we're still buddies. I've known Brian for years. In fact, I was in LA a few weeks ago and we had a lovely lunch, Ooh. long lunch together at Rocco's. Brian is now in his mid 80s and he's still, you know, working away. Wow. Uh, yeah, cool. he's got all kinds of deals coming up and more production. But Brian was the first AD and he and I kind of, I guess we were the, we saved each other down there more than once. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the, the mafia down there had said to Sandy Howard, the producer, uh, we want money from you, protection money or or else. And Sandy's told them to fuck off. And uh, they went, okay, we're going to have men up on the hillside overlooking your location now. And every day that you don't pay us, we're going to shoot one of your American crew. Of course, needless to say, Sandy didn't say a word of this to any of us. We just, me and my buddy who was gaffing it, got driven up to the set the next morning and we arrived. And now, before we went around the last turn to the, the, the location, there was a checkpoint, Charlie, at the gate there, with the scariest looking soldier of fortune standing there with a clipboard stopping us, who was, you know, carrying sidearms, AR-15 slung on his shoulder, grenades on his belt. And he's got a clipboard and he puts his head in the car to see who we are. And it's like, who the fuck are you? You know? So he took this off and we raised the arm and we drove around. And now there's this whole encampment of mercenaries sitting there with their camp follower, you know, their, their women and their children. And they've got little smoking fires going and the guns <laughs> stacked up, tied together. And it was like, what movie is this again? <laughs> right adjacent to the set and oh, this scary. was sandy's way of preventing um the the mafia paying the mafia there he hired these mercenaries to protect us where is sandy and the, the brazilian production manager came over and i said what the fuck is going on here and he, he said don't you know about this you didn't read the papers this morning. i said first i don't read portuguese and Second, <laughs> no, I haven't read the morning paper. So I, I swear, I have a copy of it over here in my office. The the headline on the, the front page of the uh, of the Rio newspaper that morning was how this American film crew were being held hostage and with wow. death threats and stuff. Oh and, my God. You know, Sandy had just done it. No, I won't tell them. No, why should I tell them they'd be dead anyway? But like so the I, sixteen I went, lions are nothing to worry about. Oh, I, I chased him around the set. I chased and I found <laughs> Sandy was hiding from me. I chased his <laughs> battery. So what the uh, fuck are you doing? You have a pride alliance on one side, gangsters on the other. I mean, and 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 not to mention the food and disease that were around. Wow. That movie started off not only with me, Michelle Phillips meeting, but on arrival there, flew down and got driven to this little town where, which was the nearest town to the location and said, well, you know, where's everybody? And they said, oh, they're having a, department heads are having a meeting on the set. And they drove me up there and I met all the different people that I didn't already know. And they were going there and they so on. And this is Ronnie Biggs and this is so on. And I went, Ronnie Biggs? The great train robbery. They held up a train in Britain and stole millions of pounds. Ronnie was one of those guys. He'd been one of my heroes. He's like a folk hero to me that he'd escaped and he engineered this magnificent 
escaped from jail when they caught him. And uh, he'd fled around the world and many stories about him being one step ahead of the law in so many countries. And then Scotland Yard discovered he was living in Brazil and they went, aha, uh -huh. and they flew a bunch of guys down there and kicked in his, his girlfriend's door where he was living and said, okay, that's it. We're taking you to the airport now. And, and uh, he was still one step ahead. His girlfriend was pregnant, and under Brazilian law, if, if you're fathering a child there, you can't be extradited. You know, it's, it's a good thing to remember if you ever happen to be, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, so he know. sort of went, yeah, yeah, you can't arrest me, you know. But wow. his his trade, he was a carpenter, and in spite of being a train robber, he had to earn a living, and he, he was freelancing as a, a carpenter for the TV and film studios down there. Wow. Um, and he'd been hired on. Wow. Savage Harvest to work. So again, I met this, you know, this incredibly important person in my life. Sandy found out who he was and, and thought it might bring disrepute on his film, I guess, and fired him, which pissed me off. But uh -huh. I used to go down at weekends, I'd go down to Rio and hang out with Ronnie Biggs. And Scotland Yard, he told me, had a death squad out to get him. And he said, you know, I'm under observation 24 seven. And just, we were sitting in the Corcovado, you know, the big forgiving Christ figure. Oh, yeah. uh, we're sitting up there drinking cold beers and he's, <laughs> he's, cool. he's telling me that, you know, there are guns aimed at him and it's like, nice, thank you. I had this <laughs> sort of strange feeling between my shoulder blades. Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs> it's been yeah, great really, yeah. That was stupid of him to fire Biggs. It seems like you could use that to promote the movie. You know what I mean? That Biggs worked on it. And... Yeah. Okay, so Ronnie yeah. sent me this photo. There we are. We're up on the oh, Cocobado. Cool. Okay, we're looking over the edge. Over at. And he sent this picture to me and it says on the back, forever looking over my shoulder, Ronnie Biggs. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh, that, that is so cool. That is one of my super prized cool. possessions. It really oh, is. That's great. Oh, that's but, so uh, God. Well, thank you so, for sharing that. So between the mafia shooting at us and the lions cheering on us and the incredibly bad food, <laughs> it was a wonder any of us got out of there alive. Yeah, but, no uh, kidding. That's I crazy. had a nice yeah. rap party at my house afterwards in LA, and I remember Tom Skerritt graced us with his presence. He's a lovely fella. He really was. Yeah, he, he seems down to earth. He seems like a cool. I mean, it's hard to tell, but from interviews I've seen with him and stuff, he seems like a nice guy. He is a nice guy, as far as I know. He's still alive. I don't know. Yeah, he is. We're, yeah, yeah, he is. The, yeah. On a side note, the poster art for Savage Harvest is fantastic too with that lion just pouncing on that woman <laughs> it's, like, it's the best mine, mine is in portuguese oh that's cool you have oh, like cool. Uh, it's, it's, I love it's uh, you know that you know everything good lord are you hidden in my office <laughs> <laughs> who can stop a killer when the law stops short what do you got so far is that nothing you have any leads uh, the guy used the same mo no what? sometimes he's just not <laughs> Sometimes ice pick strangulation. I didn't say I'd help you on this. When the cops can't and the courts won't, he'll give you justice. Terrific. You can't cool him off. Scare him off. Tear him off. You'll have to kill him off. Because when he goes out for vengeance, he goes all the way. God, no, we're not going to make it! We're going to make it! The movie that takes you right to the edge and keeps right on going. force when nothing else will do i wanted to ask about uh the another sandy howard production too uh, do you have any good stories from deadly farts deadly force. <laughs> i just remember a lot of running through dark places it was kind of like the dark i do remember <laughs> that the dp got replaced towards the end but i don't remember why david myers came in to shoot it and david myers is a, a guy who's like one of the woodstock cameramen and it's got an amazing repertoire of having shot stills and movies of a lot of 60s he was san francisco based and yeah I, I was kind of one of the very few people on the set who knew 
his reputation and he came in to finish this schlocky B movie. I don't remember what happened to the first DP, but. Yeah, supposedly, from what I've read, Sandy Howard wanted that to be like a Dirty Harry franchise for a Wings Hauser. It even said too, yeah. like, a, a, that Sam Peckinpah was attached at one point to direct, but then left the project. I'm sure, you probably don't know anything about all that, but I was just wondering if you did. I'm just... No, I, I remember Wings. I mean, w Wings and I butted up. Wings was was completely insane. <laughs> I, we've <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> wait, 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 I, I don't know if he's still around. I saw him in a... Oh, he passed a away recently, I think, just about a year really? ago or so. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, he was... Well, I can, I can talk bad about him now. <laughs> Um, no, he, he was just a nice guy, a real sweetheart, but he was he was totally nuts. We've heard uh, that and, a lot. Uh, I mean, we've heard he was a nice guy, that he was very method, but he was very crazy too. You no, know, it's like it's like Gary Busey stories <laughs> that go on all night, you know. Yeah. Um, well, give us one. Do you remember anything, anything <laughs> at all about Wingshauser? I kept bumping into Busey. I, it was weird. Well, there was the movie called, I wasn't on it all the time. I just provided a crane to them a couple of times that went, it was called, I was called. I think it was called Bulletproof. Oh yeah, I've seen that with uh, with Gary Busey. Are, are you talking about Gary Busey now, or are you talking? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bulletproof. Busey was yeah, in, I've seen that. and the producer. It was really, really creepy, particularly towards the end. So I, I, I showed up with a crane, happy as a clam, one morning out Simi Valley or somewhere, and um, you know my role was to just deliver the crane supply the crane, operate the crane for a shot or shots and collect the check and go away again. So I showed up kind of early and uh, there were a few people around having, the Teamsters were there having breakfast. So I knew a couple of guys and they said, oh, come on, have some breakfast. Said, well, yeah, are you really? You're supplying equipment to these guys? And I'm going, yeah, why not? And they were like, oh, you haven't heard. And I was like, no, tell me what's going on. They say, well, the crew checks bounced for two weeks running and so you know they wanted the crew to keep shooting and the crew said screw that we're all going home so the line producer called a meeting and got the whole crew there apparently this was like the day before she walked into the meeting with this guy wearing a sports jacket and stood in front of the crew and said so you people are saying you're not going to work anymore right and the guy unbuttons his sports jacket and he's got a gun on his belt and he's just looking at everyone and so She's saying, well, we got to get this picture finished, you guys. And, you know, we'll take care of the money stuff later. <laughs> and the electric best boy went, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. And he went to the electric truck to get his stuff and go home. And this guy with the gun followed him on the truck, put on brass knuckles and broke his jaw. And then all hell broke loose. The guy jumps out of the truck. A speeding pickup truck drives across the set and he jumps into the back of the pickup truck. He was also a stunt guy and takes off with people in hot pursuit. And there's all kinds of stories about Ventura County sheriffs being involved and stuff. It was a whole big thing. So I showed up happy as a clam, right? And ready to provide equipment to discover I've come, I've come to the gates of hell to shoot. So now the production manager's there and says, okay, so we're all ready to get the crane set up, huh? And I say, well, you know what? Before I open the trailer that's got a crane in it here, I'm going to need cash because I've just heard some really bad stories. And the guy goes, oh, cash. Well, he says, I'm not going to insult you by giving you a check because I know it would bounce. And I say, well, that's good. So, you know, we, we're going to need cash to get this show on the road today. He, go, he gives me a look and he goes away. In the meantime, one of the drivers tells me, he says, well, you know, the transpo department, their checks were bouncing too. So I got a call from my boss to come and pick up the honey wagon and take it away. So I just jumped in, I warmed up the truck and the trailers hooked up and stuff. And uh, I start driving and I hear screaming. And so I stop and I, I get out and it's Gary Busey is still in his, his trailer, right? In his section of the honey wagon. So he says, where are you going? You're driving away, I'm in it. Mr. Busey, sir, my boss says, I've got to take this truck back to the yard. So you better get your ass out of here right now. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so he uh, was not happy, but he, he got out of there, but he did. And so uh, the production manager comes back to me and he says, well, the director says he really, really wants to get this shot with the crane. I say, well, you know, my heart bleeds and I really, really want to get the shot with the crane too, but I got to get some cash first. So the director literally passed the hat around amongst production 
how much money you got in your pocket? How much cash? Oh my God. <laughs> and they managed to get enough to rent the crane and me. So <laughs> they literally handed me this fistful of bills. <laughs> and Crazy. so we did the crane shot and I went away again. And I don't know if that crew ever got paid. Wow or transpo but i kept bumping into gary it was weird i kept i went down to malibu beach and there was gary and his family hey hi, how are you doing and i looked at him and i thought this man's gonna die really soon and this was like in the early 80s you know he looked sick then i think it was before he came off his bike and then I, I there was this little restaurant i used to go to in santa monica and i went in there two different times and it was like there was like nobody else in there and there's me and then beauty walked in so and he, his conversations is, was like totally out of space. It was like on another planet. It was kind of interesting. He loves acronyms. He's always like spouting off like, do you know what fear means? It means failure, eradication or whatever. You know, yeah, he's always he's, going off on. We just saying weird shit all the time. Well, well like, there's a story too about him having a plate in his head mm -hmm. and people throwing magnets at him to see if they stuck to <laughs> his head and stuff. But, I mean, he, he's you know, had nine uh, lives, that guy. You know, like like oh, you said, he, he should have been dead in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, 12. I mean, it's insane. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, he went yeah. he went into Barge's Harley shop in Culver City and took his bike out of there and, and dropped it immediately and slid across the road on his back without a helmet on and smacked his head into the curb. That would sort of slow you down a little. Yeah. Um, uh, he's still around. He is yeah. still it's, around. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It, it totally is. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, like I said, Ling's Hauser passed away, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah, Gary Busey's still going strong. Do you have any, like, do you remember anything about, um, Hauser? Do you have any cool Hauser stories? I mean, he's just such a strange you know, guy, I, you know? I, yeah, I, I really can't, except he, he, he was one of those weird things where he sort of buddied up with the, with the key crib um, and, uh, you know, wanted to take me to parties and um, was always ready to provide a quick trip behind the grip truck, which I really didn't want to participate in. And um, yeah, and yeah, I was his buddy. I was his on set soulmate, and I didn't really know why. Um, there was nothing between. He centered in on you, huh? He zeroed in on you and was like, "I'm going to make friends." But with yeah, him. yeah, it really was. And I, I'm trying to think more. I, I and we we figured last week it was that's where Kathleen Crosby was. She was in Deadly Farts, not in. She was in the dark, actually. We well, mixed them up. Okay. We were mixing them up. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, they kind of merged. That period of my life merged into, into things. So there was the first AD who uh, claimed to have had a uh, a medical background who would give vitamin shots to the crew when they started being exhausted after fifteen or sixteen hours. Okay. And we all sure fine. Yeah, go ahead, stick that needle in me. Uh, you know whatever it is in there. Oh my God! Don't hurt me. <laughs> So yeah, there was there was there was a lot of that went on. I to this day I don't know what was in that needle, but I didn't didn't seem to brighten me up very much. But uh, oh my god, <laughs> sounds like a crazy shoot. On the next cruise stories with Jonathan Wolf. You ever reach a point in your life where you say to yourself, "This is the best I'm ever going to look, the best I'm ever going to feel, the best I'm ever going to do," and it ain't that great? Happy birthday. For Mitch Robbins, turning 39 wasn't the end of the world. It just felt like it. I'm losing hair where I want hair, and I'm getting hair where they shouldn't be here. I found four big fat ones on my back. I'm starting to look like the fly. He couldn't put his finger on what was missing. Show him the brochure. It's fantastic. But his friends could. Two weeks, the three of us, driving cattle. What, like in a truck? No, it's a real old-fashioned cattle drive. Go away with Ed. Take Phil. Go and find your smile. Welcome to the Stone Ranch. Believe it or not, that work you saw a while ago, y'all are going to be doing that the next two weeks. My ass hurts just watching this. What do you think? I think you look like one of the village people. 